I'm going to invite you to to take your Bibles and to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Yes, we are uh, in the Beatitudes, Matthew, chapter 5, but I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew 18. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, uh, that's okay. There's Bibles all around you in the pews. Feel free to grab one of those. Use it. If you don't own a Bible or you need a Bible, then take it. We want you to have the Word of God because we believe that if you read the Word of God, then God will use that to change your lives. And so uh, that's a gift to you if you need it. Uh, We're continuing our series, Are You Happy? Because we want to be happy. We want to live blessed lives. And Jesus tells us how to do this in Matthew chapter 5. We've been studying this. We've been talking about this for several weeks. We have several more to go. Uh, In Matthew 5, what's known as the Beatitudes, uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Now, this entire uh, teaching of Jesus is a radical challenge to how the world describes happiness. You know, the world uh, sells us as bill of goods on how we can be happy, and if we indulge the world's way, we're not going to be happy. We're not going to be satisfied. We're not going to get to that blessed life. And Jesus says, hey, their way is wrong. Let me teach you a new way. Let me teach you a different way. And, And that's what we're looking at here in Matthew 5. And today we're talking about a subject that Jesus is passionate about. I would argue it's one of the, his most passionate teachings. In fact, the strongest words in the Gospels are about this. And of course, we're looking at Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So we are blessed, we are happy when we forgive because we release the burden of anger that we're carrying and all that bitterness inside of us and we let God cleanse our souls from all that rage and anger and and unforgiveness that's there. Now that's simple how it works, but that's an easy concept to share. But here's what I guarantee. In fact, you can validate this for me. Does anybody know someone that you would classify as happy who is also angry and bitter? Yeah, you know, so you don't know happy people who are angry and bitter. You know, when they're angry and bitter, you kind of go, well, they're angry and bitter. They're not like uh, the most joyful people that you know. And yeah, they have their moments, but that that anger, that bitterness clouds the joy that we want to live in. And so we know right away, intuitively, the words of Jesus are right. We need to learn how to forgive. So we need to get this mercy thing if we want to live blessed lives, if we want to be happy then we need to be people who are merciful. So we're going to talk about that tonight. And it begins with understanding that God is merciful. God is merciful. Um, Now, I don't know how many of you have been uh, like me, reading through the the Bible in 90 days. But uh, when you do that, you spend the the first chunk of your time, really about the first two-thirds in the Old Testament, and you've been reading lots of uh, stuff about judgment and wrath and, and God's vengeance on his people who disobey and stuff like that. And you might even get the idea that God is harsh. But uh, God is merciful. The reason that, that he expresses himself the way he does in the Old Testament is because his people that he's calling out, the Israelites, they don't know him. And so he demonstrates his power in these great acts of judgment on the other nations that stand in their way, the the acts that created a nation out of the Exodus event. And he's showing his people his power so that they know they can trust him, so that they understand who he is, that he's greater than all these other supposed gods. And, And then he was trying to teach them the simple pattern of life. If you follow God's commands, if you'll live his way, he's gonna bless you. But if you decide that you're gonna reject God's commands and you do it your way, you live life on your terms, then it's going to end in pain and destruction. And and so God was trying to teach his people, follow me and I will bless you. Reject me and there's going to be pain. 
And, and so he wanted us to get this. But there's mercy all throughout the Old Testament if you open your eyes to it. There's mercy in the story of Jacob and Esau. Mercy in the story of Joseph and his brothers. Moses and the Exodus event. There's mercy on the children of Israel in the wilderness. There's mercy with David. There's mercy with the nation. Even though they rejected God, he brought them back to him through acts of mercy and kindness. So they had to grasp, and by the way, so do we, that God is right, and his way is the only way that leads to the blessed life. And once we understand that God is right, and his way is the only way, then ultimately we understand that Jesus is the gate to grace. Jesus is the only avenue to mercy in the true sense that is available to us. Uh, scripture puts it this way, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In other words, God's grace, God's mercy is available to everyone who calls on the name Jesus. He invites everyone to follow him into a blessed life because Jesus is the only one who can pay for our sins. And when we follow Jesus... Whoever we are, whatever we've done, whatever we've experienced, when we follow Jesus, and by that I mean that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and we make a commitment to follow Jesus. When we do that, we receive mercy, and we do not get what we deserve. We don't get what we deserve. You see... Just to be honest with you, I deserve hell, okay? I'm a sinner. I have rebelled against God. I have rejected God's authority in my life. I've crossed that line. I'm a lawbreaker. And according to the word of God, I deserve hell for all eternity. And by the way, you're in the same boat as me. We all deserve judgment. We don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve life. But, but this is a reality. Even though I chose to sin against God and the wages of that sin is death, because of Jesus, I don't get death. Because Jesus actually died for my rebellion. He died for my sin. He died in my place. And because he took my sins upon himself, I don't have to suffer what I deserve. So instead of judgment, I get mercy. I get grace. I get forgiveness. And so does everyone who calls on Jesus Christ. Now, I know there's a lot of people who want to go, hey, but, you know, I want to come to God some other way than Jesus. I want, to, I want to approach him on my terms. That's where those lessons of the Old Testament are so powerful. Even when the people of God tried to do it their way instead of God's way, God said, no, I'm God. I'm the one who sets up this world. I'm the one who lays out the plan on how you can be blessed, on how you can be saved, on how you can have life. And if you'll come to me according to my plan, according to my way, then you get life, you get forgiveness, you get heaven. But if you insist on doing it your way, then you get what you deserve. And I don't want what I deserve. I don't want what I deserve. So everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus gets heaven as their destination, even though they deserve hell. That's mercy. God is merciful to us and that we don't get what we deserve. And because God is merciful, followers of Jesus are to be mercy people. Now, most in this room are going to classify themselves as followers of Jesus. I just explained what that meant. And as I went through that, uh, a lot of you have heard that lots of times. You are going, yes, I believe that. Or maybe some of you are going, no, I really don't believe that. And, and if you don't believe that, then I encourage you to listen to the rest of this and see if it makes sense. But if you're a follower of Jesus, then um, we're to be mercy people. The story in Matthew 18 is a parable that Jesus tells on the subject of forgiveness. His disciples are saying, how much do we have to forgive? And, and Jesus tells this parable. And this is a, a harsh parable, but it's one that really is instructive. Beginning in uh, Matthew 18, beginning in verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. We'll talk about how much that is later. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. 
And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Um, followers of Jesus are to be mercy people. Does anyone else read that parable and ask, how can that servant be so stupid? Is any, anybody with me on that one? I mean, you read this and you go, what kind of a moron would do that? I mean, you just got forgiven all this stuff and you go out and you're a jerk like that? And, and, and what I found is that in the Bible, people in parables are often ridiculously stupid. You know why that is? It's so that we can relate to them. <laughs> right? I mean, because you go, how could he be that? Oh, wait, in my life, uh, okay, I get this. Um, See, this is a parable with a really strong message because forgiveness is a family value. Forgiveness is a family value. If you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus expects you to forgive. You see, we're the ones in the story. We're the ones who are reading this, who are hearing this, these words that he says, hey, I want you to understand this. I'm the king. I forgave you all this. You need to be people of forgiveness. I expect you to take your forgiveness and live it out. And, and, and so this is something that is important to God because God is merciful. We've already established that. And God was so merciful that he sent Jesus into this world to forgive you and I of our sins. That on the cross, Jesus literally didn't just die for the, the idea of sin. He died for your sin and my sin suffered for them so that we could have eternal life, so that we could be forgiven. And not only did Jesus die for our sins, but he modeled forgiveness for us, right? What did he pray when he was on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. And so love and mercy are necessary if we're going to represent Jesus to the world. Think about that. Love and mercy are necessary if we're going to represent Jesus to the world. Um, I think everybody that I talk to, it doesn't matter what their faith position is, they understand that whole concept of God is love, and we're supposed to be loving people. In fact, they love to throw that up in our face every time we stand for truth in any way, shape, or form as, as Christians. And, and so they get the whole love thing, but and a lot of times we get the whole love thing. Yeah, we know we're supposed to come in here, sing praises, loving God, celebrating God. And, and, and you know, we, we're supposed to love one another. We don't do it very well. We're supposed to love one another. But it's love and mercy. Mercy was so important to Jesus. That's why these words are so stark to us. We need to get this as a family value. And, and you know what's sad is, is that there's so many people in our churches that, that really don't get it really don't get it. They don't understand it. And they're so much like the servant in this story. I, I, you know, I grew up in church pretty much my whole life, and uh, they were always filled with people who sang the songs to God, just like we've done tonight. And, and they would say the words of rejoicing in Jesus as their Savior and, and confess that Jesus is Lord in the same way that I just described to you. They, they would say all those words. They would show up in church all the time, every time the door was open. They were a lot of times considered leaders in the church, but can I just tell you that a lot of times they didn't live a life of mercy. They didn't live a life of grace. Forgiveness of others wasn't something that came easily to them. And, and as I read this, parable, I, I go, wait, so many of us are like this servant. We don't get it. So let me ask you a question tonight. This is one that I hope you struggle with a little bit. Do you understand grace? Do you understand that God has forgiven you of all your sin? And I ask because there's this servant in the story and 
and, and he stands before the king, and the king says, pay me your 10,000 talents that you owe me. Now, we don't operate in talents, so how much money is that? 10,000 sounds like a lot, but, but what is it really? Um, well, that equates to, what's the equivalent? That's what I'm looking for. 200,000 years wages for the person who was hearing that. Yeah, 200,000 years wages. I think uh, one talent was equal to 50 years wages for an average man. One talent of silver in that day and age. Uh, the average person that was hearing this story would go, one talent, I work my whole life, I'll earn, you know, a talent of silver. And he owes 10,000 talents. So I did a little bit of math and just played with the, said, okay, if the average household makes about $50,000 a year in America, that equivalent would be if you and I owed $10 billion. Yeah. Now, Bill Gates might be able to come up with $10 billion, but he's not average. You and I. If, we, if someone said to me today, hey, you, got, you owe $10 billion, uh, you need to pay up. I, I can't afford the interest on $10 billion. There's no way I have any hope whatsoever of paying that back. And this servant knew that he had no chance of paying it back. He couldn't pay back 10,000 talents any more than you and I could pay $10 billion tomorrow. He didn't ask for forgiveness, though. What did he ask for? He asked for time. No, he didn't ask for mercy. He asked for time. He asked for an extension. Read the story again. Have patience with me and I will what? Repay you. Okay, that's a ludicrous statement, but he walked out of there not understanding that his debt had been forgiven. He thought that his debt had been extended. Why else would he walk out of there and grab somebody who owed him 50 bucks and threaten him and throw him in debtor's prison to work it off? Because he didn't get it. He didn't understand the dynamic of what had taken place before the king. Therefore, he couldn't live it out in the day-to-day -day life. Here's the reality. There's a lot of us in this room who understand the concept that Jesus has forgiven us of all of our sins. But you're not living in the reality. For whatever reason, you're still trying to pay God back. You're, you're trying to make up for the stuff that you did in the past. You're, you're trying to earn some love from God. You're trying to earn forgiveness. You're trying to do good deeds. You're trying to give enough money. You're doing whatever it is, but you are living in that place where you're thinking you've got more time when what God is offering to you is a clean slate. If I could, I would give to every person in this room the reality of grace as a gift to you, but I can't do that. But if you struggle with this concept of really embracing the forgiveness of God for everything in your life, then let me challenge you to do this. Ask God to teach you mercy. Ask God to teach you mercy. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who is the teacher of truth, and he's the one who wants to lead you into truth so that you understand mercy so that it's part of your life at the very core of your being. So that when you walk out of the presence of the king, you know that you don't just have more time, but that you have been forgiven of all your debt and you can live that joy. Because that wicked, evil servant walked out of the presence of the king and he wasn't kind and he wasn't compassionate and he wasn't caring and he wasn't merciful. And because of that, he incurred the wrath of the king. You see, God expects us to be people of mercy. Not because we have to, but because we understand that we have been forgiven. Past, present, and future. We've been forgiven of all our sins. And that is a glorious place to live. And because of that, we have a bounce in our step. And where we can lift our voices up in praise to God and thanksgiving. Because we are new creations. And we have a clean slate. And therefore, we can be kind to one another. And we can rejoice in the Lord always. And we can show mercy to one another. Even when they don't deserve it. Because we don't deserve it either. And we get it. You see, God doesn't love others and tolerate you. God loves you. And he wants to bless you. And that's why he wants you to be a person of mercy. See, followers of Jesus are mercy people. Now, I know some of you are going to be pondering that last statement about uh, understanding grace or getting grace for a while. But if you want to be a person of mercy, if you want to grow in that, let's get real practical here for this last part of this message. Let's talk about how to develop mercy. 
how to grow a Jesus heart, if you will. Uh, this is going to be real practical because I'm going to share with you some, some disciplines in your life. Not take it one time and you're good. You know, I've been fighting this illness stuff for like a couple of weeks now. And, you know, they don't just give you one magic pill. You want it, right? But they give you a course of stuff. You have to take it out over time. And hopefully over time you get better. And you stop coughing up a lung and all those wonderful things. So I'm going to share with you three steps on how to develop mercy in your life. And, and if you'll take these steps and you apply them to your life over and over and over again, what will happen is you'll begin to develop that heart of Jesus, that heart that is merciful, that can pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they, want to do, what they do. So if you want to be blessed, then here's some things you can start to do. First of all, decide to forgive. Decide to forgive. You've already said, hey, I want to forgive. I want to learn how to be a person of mercy. Uh, this is a decision to obey God. Philippians 2, verse 5, says, Have the same mind in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. Have the same attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. That is a decision to obey God, to say, God, change my heart, change my mind so that I am obeying you. If you will, it's choosing to have a mercy mindset. Saying, God, teach me to think about mercy and to live mercy. Uh, because God wants you to be people of mercy. So he's, he's with you in this. He's going to help you in this. And, and if you decide to forgive, then it means you're going to have to decide to forgive your past, present, and future offenders. Um, the past. We talk about the past a lot. Every one of us in here has scars from the past. If I were to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and ask you, tell me about the pains and the hurts from your past, every one of us has those episodes, those stories. They may be huge in your life. They may just be uh, uh, irritants in your life, but they're there. We all have those people in our past that hurt us. And just by me saying that, faces flash to your head. You, you, you've thought of somebody already. Somebody that offended you. And, and a lot of times our past hurts, they're big. They're deep wounds that linger and poison our souls. And, and you may need some help dealing with forgiving the past. You know, you may need to talk to a counselor. You may need to get into a 12-step program. That's why we have Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights, to help you deal with your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And, and it is a, yeah, that's right, it is an awesome program that will help you overcome and become free from the past hurts. So I, I'm just telling you that because we need to decide, God, help me to forgive the past. And, and I'm not encouraging you to embrace the myth of forgive and forget. You know, that is a myth, right? Can't we just forgive and forget? No. The, here's the biblical idea. Forgive and redeem. Forgive and redeem. It, it means that you recognize the hurts of the past, you forgive them, and you look for ways for God to redeem those in the future. A, a lot of you have done that through ministry. The fact that you've taken your pain and you've turned that into a ministry to others. That's how Celebrate Recovery got started. That's how our grief share groups got started. But... Uh, but here's the reality. We need to forgive and redeem. What does that look like? That means like this. Twelve years ago, we had an embezzler here on staff at Calvary. Just about killed Calvary Christian Academy in its infancy. And uh, this guy stole about $70,000 from the school. And, uh, and currently, he has a felony theft record. And uh, he, he was fired and, and all that kind of stuff, prosecuted. But if he walked in the door and said, hey, I'm sorry, and I want to be part of this fellowship, we would welcome him with open arms. Okay? He'd be welcome here at Calvary. Uh, we just wouldn't put him in charge of anything to do with the finances. <laughs> okay? Forgive and redeem just means that. It doesn't mean that we forget what you've done. It just means that we don't put you in a place to fail again. We don't put you in a point of weakness. We put you in a point of strength. And, and, and we encourage life that way. So, the past. We've got to forgive the past. We also need to forgive the present. Um, every one of you is currently in a series of relationships right now. Family relationships, friendships, work relationships, uh, neighbors, all different kinds of people around you that you're in relationship with. Are you being merciful to them? Are you starting mercy in your home today? Because here's what happens in all those relationships. We offend each other. We, we really do. And in fact, if you uh, want to be in a relationship with me, I promise you I'm going to offend you just a matter of time. And you're going to offend me, and it, that's okay. That, that's part of the, the whole relationship thing because we're sinners. 
And so we're going to offend. But are you forgiving the people in your life on a daily basis that matter the most to you? So many times what I see happen in families, especially between a husband and a wife, is that they let the little things build up. They, they build up those resentments until what happens? One day, one of them explodes. It's like a volcano going off. And the other, my, anybody's sitting there going, cluelessly looking in awe and fear. And, 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 and all those little things have added up until they destroy. Because there isn't grace for the present. Right now, you need to look at the people around you that you love, that you value, and say, hey, God, help me to forgive them today. I need to forgive them today. That's why uh, the book of Ephesians, Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Forgive today, the present. Decide every day you're gonna forgive the people in your life that you care about. And then finally, forgive the future. Have a mercy mindset. Decide you're gonna forgive people before they offend you. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. Think about this. Think about this. If you know that people are going to offend you, because we are, we already established that, we're sinners, we're going to offend, then go ahead and decide to give grace before they offend you. In other words, decide to hear your husband or your wife in the best possible way instead of the worst possible way. That's preemptive grace. Decide that your kids don't have an attitude, they just learn sarcasm well from you. That's preemptive grace. Decide that your friend didn't intentionally forget to invite you to the lunch or to the event. Decide that people who didn't show up for your special occasion or recognition didn't do it to hurt you. They just forgot. Give people grace. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Recognize that because we're sinners, most of the time, let's be honest about this, most of the time if you really look at people's lives, they don't mean to offend you. It just happens. You know, decide that the waitress didn't mess up your order on purpose, so you're going to give her grace. Decide that that driver, he didn't really mean to cut you off. <laughs> See, you decided before you leave here, when they do it, you're going to be like, hey, God bless you. <laughs> I got grace for you, and you are so lucky, you know. Um, See, we laugh about that, but if you decide in advance you're going to have grace for people, you're going to live a lot happier life, and you're going to bless those people around you. That's reality. So decide that you're going to forgive. And then once you decide to forgive, pray for those who offend you. One of my least favorite passages of Jesus, and therefore one of my favorite passages of Jesus, is Matthew 5. I actually think I'm going to start in verse 43. Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Wow. We already talked about family values and Jesus says, if you are gonna be my child, if you're gonna reflect my family values, then love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And, and what that means is that we need to step into a place of discipline where we pray for the people who have offended us. Now, if I were just to say to you, who are the people that you're most angry at right now in your life, who you really don't like the most in your life right now, just by suggesting that, again, some faces or names pop into your head. And those are the people that Jesus is saying you need to pray for. He's saying you need to put them at the top of your list. Pray for them. And, and when he says pray for them, he's not saying you, for you to pray, okay, God, get them. God, I want your vengeance and your wrath to fall upon them like Sodom and Gomorrah. And I want a front row seat with popcorn and a soda. No, that's not what he's asking. What he's saying is, God, I, I, he wants us to pray for them to be blessed. He wants us to pray for them that, that they would know God, that God would reveal himself to them, that they would know his love intimately, and his grace bountifully. Because here's what happens. Two things happen when, when you pray like that. When you seriously pray for your enemies. First of all, the things that you pray for them happen in your life. So you're praying, God, reveal yourself to them. And guess what? God starts revealing himself to you. And you're praying, God, bless them. And guess what happens? God starts blessing you and you start seeing it. And, and, and you start praying, God, you know, just pour your love out on their life. And next thing you know, you're like, experiencing God's love like you never have before. 
Why? Because you're doing what God asks you to do. And he delights not only in obedience, but in his people being people of mercy. So he shows up. The other thing that God does when we pray for our enemies is that he actually removes that bitterness and that anger from us over time. Because see, it works like this. You start praying for the people you don't like. And at first you're praying through gritted teeth, making yourself do it. All right, God, reveal yourself to them. Bless them. Let them know you love them. Great. There, are you happy now? I'm obedient. But day by day, as you have that conversation with God, whether it takes weeks, months, years, one day you wake up and you realize you're praying it and you mean it. And that when you think of that person, no longer do you have that knot in the pit of your stomach and your blood pressure goes up and you grit your teeth, but instead you realize that you really have compassion for them and you've forgiven them and that bitterness, that anger has been taken out of your soul because you've been walking with the Father of mercy. And that's a cool thing. That's a beautiful thing that happens in your life. It's not easy to get there. I share that because I told you, we had an embezzler in the church 12 years ago. He did great damage to the congregation, to the people in the congregation. And I was angry at him. And so I practice what I'm sharing with you. And I'm telling you it works. But you got to walk that path of obedience and pray for those that have hurt you. If you do that, Again, God's going to show up, and you're going to grow in mercy. And then the third thing, as you get to this place where you're growing in mercy, is you're going to look for opportunities to bless. Look for opportunities to bless. Romans 12, 20, Paul quotes uh, Proverbs, and he says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Um. God redeems by giving us opportunities to show mercy in real and tangible ways. In other words, the test is this. You know that you have a mercy mindset when you have the opportunity to curse someone who's hurt you and instead you choose to bless them. Instead, you choose to feed your enemies when he's hungry or give him something to drink when he's thirsty. And and here's the cool part. When you do that, when you have that opportunity and you actually choose to bless someone who's hurt you instead of taking revenge, Scripture says that you heap burning coals on their head. So it's kind of a win-win anyway, right? You're being obedient to God and doing what he's asked you to do, and they're suffering. It's perfect. (laughs) See, we're laughing, but God says, look, I'm going to let you win, and I'm going to let you win. If you'll believe me, if you'll follow me, if you'll trust me. See, after all, God chose to bless us in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of our disobedience. He chose to save us from hell even though we deserve it. Not because we're good people, but simply because he's a God of mercy. So do you really want to be happy? Then let go of your rage and your anger and your bitterness and your unforgiveness. Embrace mercy. Ask God to teach you how to forgive and you'll be blessed. You'll be happy because blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. Can you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for your grace, your forgiveness. Thank you that we don't get what we deserve, but because of Jesus, we have life eternal and forgiveness of sins. And Lord, our prayer is simple tonight. Teach us how to be people of mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.